Welcome to the Knowledge Graph seminar. Today, we are in the week nine of the course, where our theme is, what are some of the high value use cases of Knowledge Graph? We are very fortunate to have with us two phenomenal speakers, uh, Shashidhar Thakur and Caleb Litaru. Uh, Shashi is at Google and he is the gentleman who started, he's one of the <laughs> gentlemen who started it all. The initial uh, knowledge graph promo video that was put out uh, by Google, uh, Shashi was featured in that. And he was explaining what these knowledge graphs are <laughs> to the rest of the world. So we are very fortunate to have him here with us. And uh, Caleb is uh, a highly impactful and very energetic person. And he has um, been running this uh, very exciting project called GTEL single-handedly. And he has had a lot of impact outside uh, the computer science. So I'm really excited about today's session. This is going to be um, um, really educational for me as well as for the class, I'm sure. So we're going to start with uh, Shashi, 30 minutes for Shashi and then 30 minutes for Caleb, and then we'll have discussion at the end. Shashi, would you like to share your screen? Yes, let me do that. Does that show up for you? Yeah, it does show up, but it's kind of small. I don't know why it is so small. Okay. But the presentation shows up. Yes, presentation shows up. Let's see. Does that expand it? Yes, yes. it does. Okay. So that's hopefully better? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, great. So let's get started. Uh, Thanks, thanks, Vinay, for the introduction. Uh, I know that uh, you all have heard a lot of uh, technical details about Knowledge Graph. You had uh, Dilip Dunadong from Amazon come and talk about how Amazon constructs the Knowledge Graph through web scale technologies and so on. So I'm going to focus here far more on the product aspects, like what do Knowledge Graphs enable in practice? And I'll, of course, come from my Google experience uh, and I'll talk about those things. I'll sprinkle in bits of technology problems as well, so you can connect technology problems with product problems, so you get a feel for how knowledge graph work happens in practice in large scale systems. And, and, and so you have context, much of my work has been focused on search and bringing structured knowledge experiences in search, but as part of that on the technology side, building the representation, building the knowledge graph that spans search, local, geo, shopping, media, various things were in my purview. So I'll come at it from that experience. So I'll start, we'll talk a bit about context for knowledge graphs. I'll use KG by the way, uh, it's a short form, uh, hopefully everybody, uh, that's a standard terminology. So context for KGs, what they enable from a product point of view, as well as uh, uh, an understanding point of view. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, what it takes to scale these things in practice and some practical considerations and we'll talk about those. So let's start out with context, right? The, when we started out on knowledge graph, and I think this is the case for most of the research, most of the product work around knowledge graphs, people started out saying, hey, let's, here's all the knowledge in the world and let's build a repository of it. Let's build a repository of it, much in the sense of libraries, but here are some sort of more, more uh, specific principles, right? That if, human knowledge has learned something, then we shouldn't have to learn it again. We should be able to encode it. Uh, we should be able to infer some things. And we'll talk more about what can be inferred from what we have learned. Uh, we should be able to share it. We should be able to talk about it. We should be able to query it. So that was the, the loose principle and the picture that you see is of the famous Alexandria, the library of Alexandria. And that was the vision we started with to build a structured library of Alexandria to capture human learning. Of course, I'll, I'll preface this by saying none of us ever had any illusion that everything could be captured in knowledge graphs, everything could be structured. Of course, there's a vast variety of stuff that humans uh, have created in terms of knowledge, which cannot be structured, we understand that. Uh, here are specific examples which motivated us that Angela Merkel's birthday should be encoded here, or Charlie Chaplin's movies should be encoded here, Eiffel Tower's height should be encoded here. The underlying principle being, 
it is not just a whole collection of factoids, but it should be represented in a machine readable form at scale and inferentially possible on it. And then you compare it and, and the obvious connection is to, but wait, don't we have the whole web out there with trillions of documents, right? It contains essentially everything that human knowledge has uh, uh, ever written for all practical purposes or videos. So the way I draw contrast between structured knowledge and uh, the broad open web is that structured knowledge is more discrete uh, while prose in the form that it appears on the web is more continuous, right? It doesn't have that many constraints on it. Well, structured knowledge has constraints on it. Uh, prose and text in general can be very context dependent while structured knowledge generally tends to be context independent. And then you can draw inferences out of it in using context. And uh, uh, it is very expected to be very objective and universal. Uh, although we'll come, uh, we'll talk about some corner cases where it may not be as universal as one thinks, and you have to you have to account for those things. Well, in general, text textual knowledge ends up being very subjective. On the same topic, you might have contradictory opinions written on the web in different HTML pages, and that's all fine with unstructured knowledge. So let's jump into some, uh, let's approach this first from a product point of view. And let's talk about, okay, imagine you had built a structured knowledge graph. What can you do with it? And I'll approach it again from the point of view of Google search and uh, different search engines uh, have built similar technologies over a period of, over a period of last decade. So here's the first thing, which is, which is an important observation. Imagine, uh, imagine a user has queried for what are the events in San Jose? this weekend and imagine that and this was a screenshot taken many years ago of course we actually had concerts at that time uh, and at that time there was a lady gaga concert in the sap center in san Jose. so you can imagine uh, a structured listing of events ranked in some way uh, and in particular there's a lady gaga concert you get inspired by that and you could say okay i want to listen to this song by lady gaga or i want to watch her latest movie and then from there you quickly diverge and then other needs take over like okay when is halloween this is october when is halloween i need to figure out uh, and then other teams and where are they playing so on so forth right so the point being when you look at search queries and you look at a session and maybe you look at sessions across a period of days user journeys span many knowledge domains it's not like okay you can only focus on events and be done with it already when you talk about events you have Lady Gaga and Lady Gaga has movies and songs. The knowledge domains are connected. That's the, that's the main takeaway from this slide. And once you start with, okay, knowledge domains are connected, then what kinds of products do you want to enable? So, so that exact session, I have mapped it in terms of screenshots out here. On the left, it is something more encyclopedic about Lady Gaga. And then from there, you can go into, okay, what are... Uh, what are events nearby with Lady Gaga or uh, 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 movies starring Lady Gaga. And then you jump into one movie, the information about the movie, where is it playing, what restaurants are around this movie, theater, or you go down the events path, what are the events and where is this particular event and tell me more about the stadium or the theater where this event is. So again, this is making the same point that knowledge domains are connected and to create a great user experience, you have to be able to encode the connectivity so that you can create these great experiences. And then this is like a very high level picture of a knowledge graph with entities and connections between entities, which create these cross domain linkages. The other point I wanted to make was, it's not just about search, it's when I approach it from a Google perspective, uh, you, have cross surface experiences. Like you look at events about Lady Gaga on one surface, like search, you want to know where the theater is, you get into maps, you want to watch a movie, uh, you could bring it up on a TV or on, a, on any other display device. Uh, you want to listen to a song, so again, the same thing. So again, it's uh, the experiences of a user span the whole journey uh, across knowledge domains, but also different surfaces. And I wanted to call this out in particular. I'm really proud about uh, uh, this work, which is surprising things come out when you have a great uh, representation of knowledge. I can take a picture of the Eiffel Tower and say, what is this, right? And uh, through, through various intermediate inferences and training a 
visual model which can map visual into knowledge structures you can say oh that's i fit that or you can point at a uh, uh, at, 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 a, at a poster, a movie poster, and bring up information about the movie and so on. So all sorts of magical experiences get enabled because you tie together structured knowledge in the middle and all sorts of unstructured knowledge in the world. Like you see those documents, or uh, those could be those could be videos, or those could be pictures, and 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 boom, you get interesting things like this. So let's take a closer look at some of uh, what goes behind building these products. So the, the first set of things, uh, I, sorry, not what goes behind building it, but like, let's take a closer look at some of the sub features. So one of the sub features I'll call out is just information family. Uh, the question is, tell me about the Shawshank Redemption movie, right? And users have many sub intents around a movie like this. They might want to know who acts in it, show me pictures of it, show me a trailer, where do I watch it? Uh, is it in theaters? What are the reviews? So on and so forth, right? And you stitch together different pieces of knowledge and you can create a summary view of what's the Shoshan Redemption about. Or similarly, uh, Cascal, which is a restaurant, or about uh, a printer, which is a product. So the first thing is a, a summary view, which is stitched together across sources, which ranks information from different sources and creates a, a summary view like this. Uh, using the Google Assistant and the voice interface, I think the voice interface is secondary to all of this. I just wanted to illustrate the, the cross surface experience. I can ask questions about the same entities. Instead of summarizing, now I'm asking who plays Andy in the Shawshank Redemption? And boom, right? Like through various language understanding and mapping into knowledge, you get the name of the actor. Or you can say, when does the Castell restaurant open? Or you can ask for what are the specs of this particular Canon printer? And so you can do QA on structured knowledge. Uh, what is really interesting to me is the surprising connections part again, and this is what is shown uh, on this slide, which is exploration and recommendation. It's not just interesting to a user to understand encyclopedic, if you may, information about uh, the Shawshank Redemption and take some actions like go watch it or go buy a movie ticket for it. Uh, what are things similar to here? And again, a structured uh, schematic representation of the world allows you to make some of these delightful connections, right? Like you can go from that movie to Morgan Freeman movies or movies uh, whose stories were written by Stephen King. Or similarly from Cascal to other Spanish restaurants or tapas restaurants and so on, or other printers. So to me, that is the other thing enabled through structured representations and having an entity view as well as a connection view of things. Uh, so let's let's take a jump moving from product into technology and let's understand at least a couple of building blocks. There are many, many building blocks to building products like this. Let's let's understand a couple of building blocks. So first things first, you need to understand what the user query is about. And then how does structured understanding and knowledge graphs enable language understanding? So imagine your task was uh, a user is going to issue a query like show me the songs in the Star is Born, right? or songs in Star is Born soundtrack. And essentially your job was to parse that in a, essentially like a parse tree format. And you say songs in the soundtrack of a Star is Born. And it's deliberately bolded out there. Like I'm using bold, bolded terms to say, these are structured quantities. So the notion of songs, the notion of a soundtrack, the, the, the a Star is Born as an entity, we have recognized this somehow and we have rep represented this. And you can think of this as a translation problem from natural language text to some other more rigid, more uh, structured uh, form of representing the meaning of that natural language text. And this is a translation problem. So you can think of this as very much like the encoder decoder frameworks that uh, translation problems use. So imagine you had a whole bunch of labeled uh, examples like this. Uh, somebody has labeled these queries saying they all actually mean the same thing which is songs on the soundtrack of some movie right and different movies different surface forms maybe even different languages uh, are labeled and uh, typically you build uh, in, in, an, in if you're using neural nets to, to solve this kind of a problem you build an encoder decoder architecture 
again, very similar to translation, machine translation. And you say, I'm going to train a machine learning model, which translates the surface forms where I've abstracted away the specific movie, right? Now I realize that I've replaced singing in the rain or whatever with dollar movie. I'm just using that as a token for some movie, right? Where movie is some, uh, some structured schematic bit. Uh, so I want to translate all of these surface forms into that parse representation, right? So that becomes a standard training problem. And now when I get a new query and maybe star is one, it's just released today, right? And nobody has ever asked a query about that, that uh, movie before. I should be able to parse it because I know I can do named entity recognition on star is born, uh, recognize that as a particular entity, which happens to be of a movie. And then I can apply this model to say, okay, I can parse this one in a different surface form with a different movie name, maybe in a different language, but I can then translate that into the same uh, uh, understanding, the canonical understanding representation. So that's uh, one example of, of deep understanding that uh, structured representations and KGs can enable. And at the end of it, you can spit out the answer, which is the name, the, the songs in this movie. Uh, the other example, which I want to use again of grounded representations leading to some kind of understanding. But first we talk about language, let's talk about users and how do we understand user preferences, for instance, right? So, so uh, now firstly, you might want to model many things, right? You might want to model the interests or the personas or uh, 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 things like services that this user cares about. So already you're crossing many different domains of knowledge to model this user. And imagine that what you have to, your output has to be some vector of this form, right? Which is here are a bunch of topics or entities this user is interested in with some weights. And then looking at all the activity of the user, the output is a process form, which is like a load dimensional representation of the interest, which looks sort of like this. And you can, you can project this into the knowledge graph. Well, first you need name, named entity, entity recognition to understand from the user activities that this is the vector of interest for the user. Now you project this on the knowledge graph and you can hierarchicalize all of this. You can say Breaking Bad is a movie or entertainment and Warriors and Lakers are sports teams and so on and so forth. So you have sort of group these into, into these hierarchical forms, which again, uh, taxonomies can allow you to do. And now you can start doing inference on this. And uh, here's the example of collaborative filtering based inference, which is, hey, this user is interested in Breaking Bad, maybe they're interested in Better Call Saul, which is, if you, if you, if you remember back from the, the slide I showed about uh, related entities and exploration, other movies which are similar to Shawshank Redemption, this is a very similar problem. You're taking Breaking Bad and saying, okay, what are the chances the user is interested in Better Call Saul? And you're putting all the clues together to do the collaborative filtering. <coughs> or you can take the teams this user is interested in and say, oh, this user might be interested in Kobe Bryant, or they're interested in these politicians. Maybe they're interested in Kanye West, who have also happened to be a presidential uh, candidate in the same year. And so, so roughly, and this is a very high level view of how the collaborative filtering might work which is you know about these two entities, you know how to annotate them on text and do named entity recognition. And you know from the knowledge graph that these two people have either an acting or a, or a direction role uh, in both of these shows. And now you come upon a piece of text, right? In this case, I picked it from Wikipedia, your piece of text, which references all of these people and these movies and then you create an association saying, hey, if somebody who's interested in one, there is a certain chance they're interested in the other. And then you pick these clues from how people talk about it, how people write it, uh, or how people co-query for things. And then you do the collaborative filtering to say, okay, people interested in one might be interested in the other. <laughs> so a combination of text understanding as well as structured representation, then that's, this is a mashup of both of those forms of understanding and then you can you can create recommendations things you can also contextualize the user's interest and just uh, here's the example of two different users they're both seemingly interested in miami for the with the same weight 
right? They have sort of queried for Miami, they've read about Miami, but you look at the context in which they have read or watch videos or whatever about Miami, very, very different, right? One of them seems like uh, uh, they're interested more in news, uh, maybe they're in interested as an investor in Miami. Well, the second one seems like a local person, they're, in they're interested in local newspapers, they're interested in farmers markets and delivery and stuff like that. So the nuances and the context around somebody's interest in the entity is important. So entities end up being fairly shallow as a representation uh, when you talk about interest and context matters. But again, in the, the context can be extracted out of the activities of this user as well. And I, I'm just giving a couple of other examples, like, okay, somebody interested in Netflix might be interested in it, again, from the investment point of view, not the movies on Netflix. So, so, so as an example. So jumping ahead then, so, so we talked about uh, what products are enabled. We talked about some building block technologies which we have to build on top of the raw knowledge to build those products. Let's talk about scaling for a moment. Here, this gives you a sense of the kind of scale that we deal with. So general knowledge, right? Like, and I'm including movies, music, people. We're talking about of the order of 5 billion entities and 500 billion connections, right? So 100 connections per entity. Connections could be facts, like the height of a person. Connections could be between one entity and another, like a spouse to a spouse, uh, but total of 500 billion connections, right? You can think of the roughly as facts. Uh, in our quest to map the world, and I'm not, uh, here I'm just using businesses in the rough sense, like restaurants, hotels, monuments, uh, like place, points of interest. I'm not even counting every point on every street that we have mapped. This is not even included here. Uh, but even then you're talking about like, again, small number of billions of entities right there to map, to, to map the businesses of the world. And then shopping, if you look at uh, the, the kind of data that we are processing, there's tens of billions of entities, right? Which span offers from different merchants, the products for which those are offered, the brands represented, uh, and so on and so forth, right? So you're talking about orders of tens of billions of entities and you're talking about, let's say order of trillions of connections when you put all of this together. That's the scale that you have to talk about uh, when building these applications. So how do you do that, right? Uh, and where do you get, the first question is, uh, where do you get this information? Where do you get this knowledge? I'm listing a subset. This is not all of it by any means, but we can get this knowledge from multiple sources, right? From uh, uh, data feeds that we have purchased uh, and there are aggregators out there who are syndicating this data. So we are aggregating these purchase fees as, as one example. Uh, or schemas, where people have annotated their web pages with schemas, uh, wikis of different form, extraction. I'm not even here talking about our cars which drive around the world trying to essentially crawl the world and, and understand structure in it. Uh, curation, as, as you can imagine when you're talking about uh, uh, tens of billions of entities, trillions of connections. Curation is only going to take you so far. But one thing I would say is don't discount the value of curation in really polishing uh, some of the edges here. So it, it turns out to be pretty valuable. And uh, I'm not going to talk about all of those, but just to give you a sense, right? Uh, let's talk about, I'll talk about a couple of different mechanisms here. One is schema. So there are uh, uh, schema.org is a cross company industry wide initiative, which essentially normalizes a uh, structure that people can superimpose on top of unstructured content, such as HTML documents. So, an example is imagine you had a job posting from Indeed or LinkedIn or something. Uh, usually, that would be HTML with lots of text. The structure in that can be encoded using uh, uh, embedded markup. Uh, and this is a schema for the embedded markup. And here I'll show you one specific example of a job post, which I took out of one website. It's a WordPress developer. Uh, this is an instance of the schema on the previous slide. So who's the organization? What's the salary? Where is the job in? Uh, what's the description of the job? What's the validity? 
uh, range, date range for the job and so on. Is it full time? Is it part time? All of that is encoded in here. And what the web developer has said is, uh, I'm making this structured encoding available to search engines or, or other indexing engines to, to create products, right? It's giving permission for those. So, so that's an example. There are of course hundreds of schemas for different domains. And again, this is a cross industry initiative. So many, many companies make use of the schemas uh, embedded in, in web pages. Uh, the, set, uh, the only other example I talk about for, for scaling knowledge is uh, extraction. So here's a table. Here's a table from a Wikipedia page which talks about various wooden roller coasters, right? And how do you make sense of this, right? And how do you extract structured knowledge? Here's, an, here's sort of like a very abstract view of this. You take that same table, you've done named entity recognition. The slash m slash is the canonical ID uh, for an entity in the knowledge graph. So you'll see a bunch of slash and slashes. Wherever you have one of those, that means you recognize the entity. And you realize that the two, two entities in pink on the left, those we didn't recognize, pretty much everything else got recognized. So that's the first level of understanding the named entity recognition. But then there are implications. So for example, the lightning rod ride is in the Dollywood Park, which happens to be in the United States and runs at a given speed. So, so the ride implies the park and the park implies the country. So you have like a hierarchy to your understanding of the space. Uh, and all of this can then be extracted as a hierarchical structure, as an example. Uh, the uh, last part I will point out about creating this kind of knowledge at scale is you have to compose across sources. It's not like you're going to get everything from a schema or it's not like you're going to get everything out of extraction or from a purchase source. Here's an example, this is a movie, and even to construct the information panel out here, you get the trailer, video link from the studio. Many, many streaming providers have uh, ways to view this, Disney being one. Uh, maybe in this case, Disney is the only one, but in general, it could be multiple. Uh, web has marked up the reviews for this movie, Wikipedia has a description. You cull all of this together and create a comprehensive representation. And the way you create this comprehensive representation is this is sort of abstractly showing, imagine you had data sources for people and another data source, another set of data sources for movie. Well, they're not isolated domains. Again, going to the first thing that I said in this talk, people are connected to movies, movies are connected to companies, companies are connected to places, so on and so forth. So the, the knowledge you get about people from a source might actually contain references to movies. So you need to link those together, a process we call reconciliation. And when you reconcile and you compose all of these pieces of knowledge together, you get a compose graph, which is the final KG out of which you can start building these products. Uh, and as a last, in the last minute, the things I'll cover are some of the fun things that you'll work on when you try to build these scaled uh, applications on structured knowledge. And I'll just mention a couple of practical considerations. One, and as I stated earlier, don't discount the value of manual operations not everything can be algorithmic or automatic. Uh, learn, this, learn this over a period of years that certainly data labeling to train your machine learning models, you need, you need humans of in some shape or form. Evaluation, how well are you doing with respect to your metrics, target metrics. Curation we talked about earlier, source mapping. So you have your canonical, we have our internal canonical schema and the sources might have different schemas. When we purchase a feed, when we extract it out of schemas marked up on the pages, they have a different source schema. So somebody has to do the mapping and uh, normalization to the desired target schema. You need, humans are a great way to, to do that at scale. Uh, so these are examples why manual operations are really valuable. Uh, another sticky thing you have to deal with in practice is policies. And remember initially I said, Structured knowledge is universal and not quite so. Here's an example. The map of India, if you query from India versus the US, looks different because there are disputed areas and there are local policies in different jurisdictions which say you cannot or you can show things this way or that. And there is no universal truth because hence it's disputed. So you have to abide by, to, for a scale product, you have to abide by local policies. And so you need essentially variants of truth. Uh, to be able to support these products. 
and you need policy for a very different reason. So here was a real example which blew up in the press, uh, which is at one point we did some extraction and uh, we concluded that the ideology of the California Republican Party is Nazism. Now, of course, there was some uh, vandalism on a wiki page, and that's how we picked it up. Quickly, Wikipedia went and fixed the vandalism, but for a brief amount of time, we persisted this one. And as you can imagine, this, this is incredibly embarrassing, and this is obviously not, not, not a great, uh, great, great experience for the user, but you need policies to deal with situations like this. When can you take out something that is a fact on the web, for example? And that's, that's what I had in terms of prepared material. Thank you for your attention. And I know we'll come back to Q and A. So looking forward to having more of the conversation later. Oh, thank you, Shashi. Uh, Caleb, you're up next. Excellent. Let's see, can I share my screen? Yeah, I think Shashi will have to stop sharing. Yes, let me do that. I just sort of figure out how. Did that stop it? Uh, no, it still says someone else is sharing. Okay, let me let me just leave and come back because this is not allowing me to stop. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, great. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, we can. Excellent. All right. So what I'm going to talk to you about is, so the Genome Project is an open data project. It's this idea of scooping up the world's information and trying to catalog uh, the world's events, narratives, emotions, uh, imagery in real time, and looking across text, it's still imagery, spoken word audio, and video, and basically essentially using these, these essentially essentially taking sort of that fire hose of planet Earth in real time and actually generating an open data catalog of what's happening around planet Earth. And this is actually a real image, by the way. There's actually NOAA Science on a Sphere with, with one of my data sets on it. Um, so, so essentially, we start off with news. So, so the GDO project is really about news because news is really sort of that, that real-time catalog of society, and it also goes back through time. So it allows us to understand something's happening here right now. Is that unusual, for example, if we look at it? Um, and so we start with news. So essentially, um, and this is actually an image of um, all the locations that GDOL has monitored uh, events about or things about uh, over the last uh, X number of years. Um, and what's interesting about this is typically we see maps like this and we say, wow, you know, that, that looks interesting. But what's so fascinating about, you know, news in particular is, again, we're trying to draw from across planet Earth. We want to get the local perspectives across planet Earth, which means we have to understand the world's languages. And the multilingual piece is enormously, enormously difficult. So GDL today monitors worldwide news coverage in 152 languages, which again, is just scratching the surface of news, but in terms of news that's accessible digitally, whether that's through uh, broadcast, uh, whether that's through online or so on, um, that constitutes uh, somewhere in the, the sort of 90, 97 point something to 99 point something uh, percentage range. Um, and what we do for those 152 languages, we live translate 65 of those. So absolutely everything that we observe in those 65 languages, we live translate in real time. Um, and this actually came out because in the aftermath of the 2014 Ebola outbreak, turns out we had actually received from a, from a broadcast partner um, and actually uh, radio broadcasts uh, from the Forest at Reasons of Guinea. Um, they were in French though. So we at the time period were not able to translate at scale. Um, and so uh, we actually now translate skill. Where this becomes interesting is actually there's a company up in Canada, Blue Dot, that actually sent out one of the, one of the first worldwide alerts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, our data showed it on December 30th. Um, you know, they had their humans go through, verify, verify, look at things. And then on December 31st, 2019, sent that out. And again, the power of no one was watching Wuhan at that point. Um, you know, looking at local language press, looking for a major disease outbreak. So again, the power of machine translation, um, so we can look across the world. And this is something that's really important to us, is when something happens somewhere around the world, we want to be able to both look at local coverage of what's happening there, but also, again, depending on if it's a contested situation, maybe it's a repressive country, um, we want to be able to, you know, gather from, you know, sort of triangulate what's occurring there, but then look at how the world's reacting to that. So we want to, we want to essentially remove language as a barrier, to be able to see local perspectives across across the world. Um, so that adds that additional complexity in that we have all this massive machine translation on top of all that. Um, and here, for example, um, this actually shows the importance of translation. This is Yemen. You can see the blue is the locations of Yemen being discussed during part of the Civil War. 
um, in uh, in English versus read in Arabic language press. So again, really demonstrating the the importance of looking across languages. Um, and I'm going to come back. I'm going to come to the knowledge graph portion in a moment. I just want to kind of talk about some of the ways that GDELD is used. Um, so again, what GDELD does is essentially we have this fire hose of news coming in. We machine translate in 65 languages, but we have 152 languages there. Um, in collaboration with the Internet Archive, we have television and radio. Um, we you know do our own web crawling. We have all this material coming in, and we create a whole bunch of different data sets that attempt to so essentially attempt to catalog society in real time. Um, so we have event data sets that try to look at physical events around the world. Um, so that's uh, basically groups like BBVA use that um, to map out in real time things like refugee inflows and outflows. We can look at narrative. So looking at simply the co-occurrence. So building up, you know, once we know, here's every reference to, say, um, you know, Joe Biden. Here's every reference to Vladimir Putin. Um, how often do those co-occur? And in what context do they co-occur? Is it negative or positive emotion? Is it anxious emotion? Is it fear of the future emotion? What are all the different dimensions of each of those connections? We can then abstract those um, at larger scale and actually make visualizations like this and actually of interest um, so google has something called bigquery which is their one of their large database platforms um, we've actually built co-occurrence graphs um, of more than a trillion edges in bigquery um, but this is actually one of the, the, the amazing things to me is you know we've reached that point where you know I, I come from the nsf supercomputing world so you know i used to you know work with the, the mat i was one of the the friendly users that got onto each of the new machines and kind of pushed them to their limits um, but, you know, in an HPC world, like, you're the one responsible for trying to, you know, trying to do graph analysis this scale. To me, one of the amazing things with the cloud is we've reached that point where something like BigQuery, which was not designed to be a graph database, um, I can load, I can essentially take a data set, construct a graph on top of that, um, and then basically build that trillion edge graph, collapse that down, and output um, actually a file to actually, in this case, visualizing Gephi um, or GraphViz. Um, so again, just simple things like co-occurrence graphs, and this is actually CCS here, and you can actually see all the people mentioned in there around the fringes of those are actually all the reporters uh, there. We can do things like map, like map global happiness through the lens of the media. So this is not, um, you know, whether people in a certain area are happy or sad. This is, if you take what the world, take like Paris, Paris, France, um, look in a given day, what is all the news coverage that we monitor across the world saying about Paris? Are they portraying it in a good or a bad light? Um, and this becomes very powerful in terms of thinking about, um, you know, sort of the emotion, like how things are framed um, around the world. Um, we can do now casting and forecasting, you know, thinking about sort of events, um, you know, and really where we get to then is data sets. So GDEL is essentially this huge collection of open data sets. We have an event data set. Uh, we have our main global knowledge graph, which I'll come to. Uh, we have visual knowledge graph. We have all kinds of different data sets. And uh, actually two data sets we've, that I forgot to add on here. Um, so um, as was you know, mentioned earlier, schema.org. So we do have a data set where every news article that we monitor around the world, we scan it for any, meta, any HTML meta tags embedded within the article. We extract those out and any schema.org blocks that are in there. And it's really interesting today because a modern uh, news website will have a schema.org block describing the page as a whole sort of maybe the news article, each embedded section, like a video or an image, oftentimes will have its own schema.org describing it. Um, and you end up, it's, it's actually really interesting, too, of, you know, when you're trying to process this material, you know, schema.org, you know, they're, they're it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, it's a, a well-defined schema. You know, for example, it says this text, this field should be numeric, uh, or this field should be a date. Uh, it's really interesting what you get in real life. Um, and um, so we've actually done a lot of work, um, you know, describing on our blog, you can see that. So we actually do extract out schema.org so you can actually process that directly. We also now have a numeric graph, um, which I, I didn't have, a, I forgot to add on here, where we extract out any references to numbers in those 152 languages. So a news article, for example, in Burmese, if you're interested in looking at, um, you know, what are the number of, uh, how, how large are the protests that are occurring right now? You can scan Burmese language press and actually get out all those numbers. And that becomes very interesting to look at. Let's say you have ground knowledge. You know a protest yesterday was a certain size. You can use this data to actually look at um, you know, how big was it, you know, how big did local press describe it as? What about regional press? So you can look at these discrepancies between, I know how many people were there, um, how big was it described um, in other press? So again, these, these really fascinating ways of, of representing it. Um, and everything, so GDELD is an open data data set, uh, series of data sets that lives entirely in Google Cloud. And we use, especially in the lower right there, all the different GCP AI APIs um, to try to peer through all this news and try to catalog it in different ways. Um, so one is text. And oftentimes when we think about knowledge graphs, we think about codified um, graphs, you know, like, for example, so-and-so is the parent of so-and-so, or, you know, so-and-so, Joe Biden is the president of United States. 
Um, one of the things that we see is we actually look at graphs a little bit more broadly. Um, so one of our data sets is the quotation graph. So every news article, we scan it for any quoted statement that appears in that article. Um, and then we, so we extract that. So we'll say, here's an you know, article, CNN article today. It includes these three statements by, say, Dr. Fauci. Um, so we see those as nodes. Those quotes are nodes. Um, and each, again, different pieces of that. And then we have sort of the context in which it occurred in. So we have sort of the speaker of it. We have the context in which it occurred in. So is this someone, you know, condemning, saying, look at this terrible statement this person made, or wow, this person really understands things. Um, so that's really fascinating. When we start thinking about everything as a graph, uh, that becomes very powerful. We think about this ability to, you know, to connect statements to people, to places. You know, where was the statement issued? Was the state issued? So you have a person saying a statement in a place, maybe a conference, uh, maybe referencing other places. So again, this becomes very fascinating. We think about all those hidden connections uh, that exist within that. Um, we have things like, um, for example, we run a random sample of these articles each day through Google's natural language API. So that does a lot of things. That constructs, for example, uh, dependency parse, extracts all the entities for 11 languages they support right now. The entities, each entity is encoded in the Google Knowledge Graph. And I know there was a question earlier about the, the codes there. Um, so there's actually, um, so speaking as, you know, from at least from what we see, again, you do have the traditional, you know, the traditional ID codes, um, but you do Google itself, you'll actually notice, you'll see like a slash M, uh, which is more of the, you know, free base and the other codes, then like slash G, um, which are more like the Google created codes. It's actually really fascinating because, for example, when the Notre Dame fire occurred, within an hour or so of that fire, there was now a new code, the fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral in France. Um, and so now that entity, any description, you actually saw that as a unique identifier now for that event. And this becomes very powerful. So one of our things, we extract out all the entities from that, but then also all the parts of speech. So you can do all kinds of fascinating things about, you know, how often are verbs connected to nouns in this context versus that. Is this evolving? So we've worked a lot with linguists um, to actually understand. So the context, if you think about, again, language as a, as a graph, um, the roles in which certain words are appearing, like is, for example, impact is not a verb. It is used as a verb now. So, you know, how things are changing over time, we can look at, for example, you know, look at essentially represent, you know, all these, all these documents, massive graphs, and look at the roles of words. Um, we have our global knowledge graph. Um, our global knowledge graph is one of our core data sets. So essentially what we do there is we extract out people, organizations, locations, um, about 2 million or so topics, and about 4,000 emotions. And emotions are really interesting because what you think about these graphs, you know, if I say that, you know, Dr. Fauci made this statement here, um, you know, that's, that's a represent, that's a, you know, that's a link, but I can tell you, for example, what was the tone of the article discussing that quote? So, you know, was this quote reproduced in an article that was a sort of condemnation, um, article versus one that was very laudatory or praise. So again, being able to take, not just establish a link, but establish the context of those links and how that link is changing over time, for example. And that becomes very, very powerful. Um, we have a difference graph. This is very interesting. Every news article we crawl, we recrawl it after 24 hours and after a week, and I catalog all the changes in there. So you can actually look, you know, think about the news not just as a steady stream of information, but, you know, news articles are being quietly rewritten, deleted. A government doesn't like an article that criticizes it, so it gets removed. So thinking about even that, that rich landscape, we're not thinking, you know, think about the news. It's not just an append-only fire hose moving forward through time. We're moving forward, but articles are disappearing. They're being rewritten, wholesale changing. So if we reference, if we extract out a factoid and say, so-and-so said this, um, and we link to that, well, you know, a couple hours later, the government might say, you know, that wasn't good, and rewrite the article, order the news outlet to rewrite that article to remove any, any statement or completely rewrite that, that quote. And so now, all of a sudden, we're, we're reaching back. So for us, also, we have to catalog. So we actually, every news or every online news article we find, we actually send a copy, actually, to, we work with the Internet Archive, and they ingest the copy into the Wayback Machine. So that way, we can say, well, you know, at this is a particular timestamp when we saw it, this wasn't here. It may not be there now. So this actually becomes very interesting, too, in terms of the fluidity of the online world. When we talk about constructing knowledge graphs over things like Wikipedia or things, you know, we realize, yeah, Wikipedia changes over time. Um, but, you know, if Wikipedia says, you know, Joe Biden was born on a certain date, um, you know, and that date is correct, we don't assume that that, that date's going to change over time because, you know, again, maybe malicious activity. But again, there's this assumption that malicious changes will be reverted. In our world, when you're trying to collect across the whole world, that's not the case. Um, you know, it's a really, really fascinating landscape there. So looking at those graphs and looking at, for example, instabilities within, uh, within subsections of those graphs can tell us a lot about sensitivities. We also have a geographic graph. So we, we, attempt, we perform full-text geocoding across the 65 translated languages. So we can do things like, say, 
find me all the locations that are mentioned with respect to Angela Merkel. Um, we can actually look at, you know, things. Find me all the locations associated with Calif all the locations in California associated with quarantine and actually make time schedules of that. Um, we have the Television Explorer. So this is an interesting one as well. Um, so this is a, a collaboration with the Internet Archive um, where we actually take their television news archive um, and we allow you to full text search the closed captioning there. What becomes very interesting about this um, is once you think about that as a graph, we can say, for example, take a keyword. So hydrochloric. Queen. I can't even say it correctly. Um, so you think about that. Okay, we made a keyword, you know, so we're searching for this keyword. And, you know, traditionally you make a timeline, you know, how often it appeared. Um, but we don't think about that as a graph, as a keyword search, not a graph. Well, in my, you know, oftentimes as a journalist or a researcher, what you care about is who's talking about that keyword. So here, if we think about that keyword and we think about all the television shows it appeared in, so this is actually a, gra this is actually a chart showing the top television shows that covered it. Now, all of a sudden, we can start thinking in terms of a graph. So every word is associated with certain television channels, is associated with certain television shows. So now we can start thinking about that as a graph. Um, in terms of, for example, if I look at personality different shows, find me all the words or phrases or topics that are associated with more with personality driven shows across any channel um, versus hard news shows. So those tend to be the words that are more disputed or partisan, perhaps. Um, and so, again, we can think about the context, not just timelines, but the context in which those occur, which becomes very, very powerful. Um, we also have the entity graph. Um, so this is more, you know, what we traditionally think of as a, as a knowledge graph. Um, so this is where we're taking uh, both television uh, closed captioning and online news articles, and we run them through the uh, we run them through Google's natural language API, extract out all the entity references. Um, so it does things like coref, does you know entity resolution. So you know President Obama or uh, you know President Obama and Barack Obama resolve to the same entity code. So we can look at co-occurrence graphs or so on. You know, and then we can you know look at subsets of these and, and draw them in different ways. Um, we can also do, again, because we have those dependency parsers from the Natural Language API, we can do things like Q&A. Has so-and-so met so-and-so? So, again, we just take that graph, we find the two entities, and we look at all the cross traces there to say, you know, is there any link that, that moves essentially through the verb of um, verb representing to meet? Um, we can do really interesting things. So this was a question, has climate change contributed to Australian wildfires? So there what we did, again, climate change, Australian wildfires, and we looked for some verb representing contributed. What becomes very interesting there is we see three major paths. One, uh, this is very interesting in particular, within just the BBC, we see, so just one news outlet, we threw three paths. One is yes, one is no, and one is maybe. So again, this ability, once you think about these graphs, to use just traditional graph, um, you know, graph, uh, um, um, you know, basically uh, walking through a graph to do some of these really interesting things. Now you get really interesting. So Google has something called the inference API, um, which allows you, for example, look at statistical uh, to essentially say, you know, what is more like this? So we can take someone like Robert Mueller and we can say who co-occurs at Robert Mueller more uh, than, you know, they, they, they occur more with him than they do without him. Um, this becomes very, very interesting. So you can actually see these really, you can do dates, events, people, works of art, all the different classifications. So the NLP API actually classifies entities into events, dates, works of art, all kinds of different classifications. And we can then uh, do all kinds of really, really fascinating inferences. So this becomes very interesting because we can induce connections uh, between things. So, you know, again, even if we don't have an article that says SpaceX uh, was founded by uh, Elon Musk, we can see that those two are essentially inseparable. So we can induce there's some kind of strong connection uh, between these two. Um, now, of course, text is just one piece of it. Imagery is incredibly powerful. Um, so one of the things that we do is we've run about half, every day we run a random sample of all news imagery we encounter on the web on news coverage. We run it through um, Google's Cloud Vision API, which is their machine vision API. Um, so we've run about half a billion images through that now. Um, and we do, uh, we enable OCR, geographic locality, um, you know, uh, EXFIF. We also then take it, extract out any EXFIF metadata that's found in there. We do a reverse image search. Um, again, Google does not do facial recognition uh, for that, or certainly we don't use facial recognition for that. Um, now, what you can do, though, is you can say, like, find me all the images that are captioned a certain way. Um, so you can do really, really interesting things like reverse image search and so on. So, for example, we can say, find me images of flooding or natural disaster around the world. And we can create these maps actually in real time over time. Um, we can actually look in the background and say, find me imagery of trash, for example. So I actually, you know, gauge world pollution there. Now, again, thinking about graphs, what we have is a collection of images, and for every image, basically a list of labels and everything else there. So again, this is, a, this is actually a, a piece of uh, SQL and BigQuery. Um, so again, a simple little block of SQL, we can now make a co-occurrence graph 
um, over all those labels and say, what are the types of visual labels that co-occur more often? Now, some of those are in induced, uh, you know, things that the model itself has induced, but actually you see a lot of unexpected things. So we can narrow in, for example, the business press might uh, relate certain entities differently than say the mainstream press. Um, you know, what is a bus, for example? That becomes very interesting. Uh, you know, what is a bus around the world? And you see just how different they are across the world. We do, and again, we can look at different resolutions of that. So we can, we can essentially, um, you know, construct different densities here. Video, of course, is really, really interesting. So again, you know, think of it, you start with a still image, um, and what we end up with that is, again, all these entities, and again, all those are in the Google Knowledge Graph. Um, and it's really interesting because Google's Knowledge Graph, um, it is, you know, they're, essentially you have this gigantic multimodal graph. So that graph exists over text, still imagery, and video. Um, so it becomes very powerful because, for example, I can use a code, I can use, for example, the code for a dog, and I can, or let's say a golden retriever, and I can identify a textual reference to a golden retriever, I can identify a video appearances of a golden retriever, and golden retrievers and imagery using that same code across modalities. Um, and so for video, we do two things. We do look at text, so we use the closed captioning, and we allow you to do interesting things over closed captioning. Um, but where things get really interesting is, you know, eliminating the closed caption, because again, a lot of video is not closed caption. Um, and we do a couple things. So one is we do do automatic speech recognition. I wanted to point out that um, Google's video model, which is part of their video um, system, the video model is only for English right now. It is more accurate than human transcription. This is, this is huge. This is a huge, huge change. Um, uh, so what we've done is for, for television news, humans literally sit there and type out the closed captioning that you see on television. So we have human-generated captioning. We're able to look back over 10 years of footage and then compare uh, 10 years of video and actually compare that to the ASR um, and actually show that the, the machine actually does a better job. It's actually more accurate. Um, so it, it, for example, gets things more correct. And when the human gets tired, the machine doesn't get tired. So even if, for example, someone's going very fast or using very technical terminology, uh, the machine beats it. And it's, that's, that's a huge, huge change. Uh, but of course, usually what we're more interested in is the visual component of this. You know, again, ASR, you know, again, if I already have human capturing, I don't need ASR. What I do need, though, is to say, like, what's visually on the screen at any moment? Um, so we have run, so in collaboration with the Internet Archive, we've run BBC uh, News London, CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, um, nonstop. This is actually nonstop now since January of last year through present, 24 hours a day. Um, Google's Cloud Video is watching those. It's OCRing everything on screen in about 300 or so languages, um, and all the labels, all the entities that are seen in there. And then the ABC, CBS, NBC, Evening News going back a decade. Again, all this is available. You can download this data right now and experiment with it. Uh, so you can do a whole bunch of different things with it. So we have an interactive search engine where you can keyword search, or you can just you can use it in BigQuery, or you can download. If you want to download a couple hundred terabytes of JSON, you can go for it. So you can actually see like what does a, a cloud video, you know, if I run a state of the art video annotation tool on a broadcast video, like what does that look like? Um, well, you can download that right now and experiment. Um, and what's one one of the very interesting things here is cloud video is frame level. It's annotating that footage at an individual frame by frame. Humans, on the other hand, tend to think of airtime in seconds or fractional seconds. You know, we're not looking, we're not looking at every individual frame. So this becomes very interesting, actually, when you're balancing human annotators with machine annotation, because the humans, like if you say catalog, you know, all the things you see in each second of footage, um, this is actually an advertiser. This is for a particular uh, particular movie. Uh, in one second of airtime, there were five separate scenes in one second of airtime, because again, real fast uh, cutting. The machine, again, frame by frame by frame by frame, annotated all that. So as a human, you look at this and you say, well, how can a helicopter and a metal and a person and the sky and this, like, there's no way those could all be, you know, in one second of airtime. Um, so this becomes very interesting as we think methodologically, machine generated knowledge graphs are so precise. How do you, you know, how do you union those then with human generated uh, graphs, like human rater information? Um, things like summaries, one of the things we're very interested in is looking at you know, the difference between sought changes. So, for example, CNN might be talking about a story. The person in the newsroom talks about it, then they cut live to a reporter, then back them back. Same story, just different camera changes. So you can't use camera changes to split up a story. You have to do something more. So we've done a lot. Um, so Google, by the way, if you have not played with Google's AI workshop, um, just look for Google's AI workshop. They have an incredible list of tools, a number of which indeed, uh, address knowledge graphs um, that you can just sign up for and experiment with already. Um, and so one of the things we've done is we've done a lot with semantic similarity to actually allow us to segment, uh, segment things. Now, once you have you know, television, you start with a you know, petabyte or more, many, many petabytes of video. You start with petabytes and petabytes of video. You end up with essentially a JSON uh, annotation, basically a graph essentially of, of labels, of OCR text, of shot changes, of all these different attributes um, over that. 
Um, now we can do many different things. We could say, find me footage, for example. Uh, now, what was very interesting is one of the things we asked it was, um, we said, what is different? So we took that knowledge graph and we said, what's different about the knowledge graph in the COVID era from the knowledge graph in the pre-COVID era, constructed over labels, over visual labels? And the very first thing that came out, the strongest difference is bookcases. Everywhere on television in the beginning of the pandemic were bookcases because people were presenting from home. Everybody stuck a bookcase behind them. Um, so again, this ability to do it, or for text, we were able to see WebEx on uh, on um, um, CNN because they were a part, they used that for that. Um, OCR, so again, um, it's OCRing in, I forgot how many, what, 300 some languages now. Um, we were not expecting to see, um, to see Urdu, um, or is it Urdu or Arabic, I forget which, um, Umar Media on ABC News, it was a broadcast, this is Taliban's uh, broadcaster. Um, again, it transcribed, the cloud video transcribed that perfectly. And for us, then we see that all that OCR text, again, is a graph. Um, which words are co-occurring, what else, what label. So you think about each individual word, it's a graph. It's essentially, you know, it appeared in this second of airtime. Here are the other words it appeared in. Here's the visual labels that were on screen when this word appeared on. Here's the show, the channel, the time, everything. It's essentially an enormous, enormous graph that allows us to ask, for example, do certain words appear only, you know, are they most strongly, do they appear on screen when certain labels appear on screen, for example? Um, then we can do all kinds of things, again, motion OCR, and we can look at different things. Um, then we can look at this to say, for example, CNN's COVID dashboard, we can use OCR to see, you know, where is that, where is that not? Um, we can do interesting things. So we scanned um, the on-screen text for all of Donald Trump's tweets. So this is an interesting question, an interesting modality example. So we wanted to see Donald Trump's tweets, how often were they reproduced on television news? So we took the on-screen text, we took Twitter's archive of all the 56, I think, thousand tweets he sent, we took um, anywhere, any text on screen that we saw at real Donald Trump, we took that on screen text, we merged that, we did fuzzy match against the Twitter archive, merged those together. So now each second of airtime, we say there's a Donald Trump tweet in this second of airtime, and we connect it to the actual ID of the actual tweet. And then we connect it to additional attributes, for example, and these were hand collected. You know, was that, was that tweet flagged as misinformation? Was it, you know, deleted and so on? Um, so now you have this enriched. We've taken one modality and we've connected it to another modality that allows us to ask really, really Really interesting questions there. Um, we can also do really interesting things with, for example, doctors. Who's telling the COVID-19 story? So this is really interesting, the fact checkers. Um, who's appearing on television to tell that story? So again, we can scan the Chiron. So this is the text on the bottom. It says who's speaking. We can scan that and then connect that and actually inventory, you know, who's speaking on each of these channels. So are these immunologists? Are these, you know, vaccine specialists and so on? Um, so this allows us to then, again, connect out, create knowledge graphs of higher and higher levels of abstraction. Um, we can then look at through the anatomy of a broadcast. We can look at things like visual similarity. You can see on the right here, um, you know, some of the labels that get constructed from this um, that are seen there. We also do this for radio, so speech recognition on radio. Again, treating that, again, as this graph of text there. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about, um, uh, for COVID-19 in particular, um, so uh, an offshoot of the Internet Archive is the Media Data Research Consortium that we collaborate heavily with. Um, so they actually have a Google Cloud research grant quantifying the COVID-19 public health media narrative through TV and radio news analysis. So this is actually a grant essentially to catalog radio and television news um, and generate even richer uh, data from this. So uh, this is actually, we got radio, television, web, um, uh, all this difference. So online imagery. Again, we have all these annotations available to study, for example, disease. So we have all these different major disease outbreaks. And one of the things that we're trying to understand is how diseases have been cataloged differently across time. So how was the COVID story told differently than, say, the Zika story or the Ebola story. And this becomes very interesting from a public health standpoint. And again, if we think about these as graphs of, of every entity, not just, you know, a graph like schema.org, but everything's a graph. You know, the appearance of something in a certain uh, snippet of time is essentially a graph connection between that entity and that moment in time. Um, and this becomes very powerful as we think about, you know, these, these incredibly, incredibly rich graphs. And then finally, the relationship graph. So this is something we're pushing uh, ever towards. Again, you know, one of the things that we want to be able to do is read the news media each day, extract out all the factual claims being made in that, and look, for example, for contested narratives. Um, so what we'd love is to be able to say, you know, take in the early days of the COVID pandemic, European uh, media was saying, you know, European leaders were saying, wear masks. Here in the U.S., public health authorities were saying, don't wear masks. Um, now, what, now, again, that was a big enough deal. Everyone noticed that. What we'd like to be able to do is have a machine that can autonomously detect that, say, hey, we're seeing a lot of statements to wear it here, a lot of statements saying not to wear it here. Identify that. Again, you're not, who knows what the right answer is. The machine certainly doesn't. But then to be able to alert fact checkers, journalists, policymakers, public health authorities, and others. 
Um, so we're doing a lot of work there, um, trying to see like, what would these type of graphs, like what would that look like? Um, and, you know, especially in the chaos of the world, everything's contested. Um, you know, mo there are very few things on this earth that everybody agrees on. And so what you end up with is very interesting when you induce things from the live web. Like by the time, like Wikipedia is an interesting example. By the time something makes it to Wikipedia, um, you know, you think about anyone can edit Wikipedia, but you have these editors that enforce this sort of form of normalcy. And if there's too much, there's disagreement, like there's an edit war, the editors come in, they lock the page, they come up with what they believe the right answer should be, and there's a single answer there. So it gets locked. You don't see the edit warring. Because we're looking at news as a firehose, we see those edit warrings in real time. And so for us, like, you know, how many protesters were there, you know, at a certain, uh, you know, protest somewhere? Uh, you know, according to, according to the government, there was nobody there. What protest? According to this group, oh, there was 10 million there. Um, and so, you know, and you see this in real time, you actually see these battles. So this becomes very, very interesting. And to us, again, that's actually the interesting part is to identify there's, there's something there. Um, and so again, um, you know, Gino, again, everything I've shown you is public data. Um, it's an enormous public data set. You've got text, imagery, audio, video. Um, you've got schema.org, uh, you know, extraction. You have, uh, you know, our knowledge graph, geographic analysis, all these different pieces. Um, so it's enormous, enormous. And again, just go to gdaltproject.org, um, go to our blog. You can download all the data sets today to experiment with. Thank you so much. And I know I've covered a huge amount of ground, but hopefully that inspires you uh, to look more. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. That was uh, really a inspiring whirlwind tour of a whole range of applications and possibilities uh, that can be that you are enabling and your work is enabling. We have a ton of questions in the Q and A chat. Uh, uh, Naren, do you want to pull out sure, something? Sure. I think today's lecture is really popular. So thanks to both of you. There are tons of questions. So maybe we can start with Sashi. Um, Shashi, is knowledge graph a good paradigm? Uh, so it's it's right now a good paradigm for modeling and storing factoids, but how about storing different kinds of things like proofs for Pythagoras theorem, traffic laws, et cetera, probabilistic information, et cetera? Yeah, <clears throat> there have been many attempts uh, at like they're talking about probabilistic information. For example, the question is whether collaborative filtering information how, what is the likelihood somebody interested in one entity might be interested in another? Uh, it's all a question of how you define the abstraction. Like internally, we define the knowledge graph as the pure deterministic factual stuff. And then there are layers on top of the knowledge graph, which do the computation on it. And for example, collaborative information might stay at a higher layer of the knowledge graph. Uh, some of the other examples that you talk about, uh, uh, beyond factoids, uh, like for instance, unstructured data, right? When you have named entity, re entity recognition on videos or on uh, pieces of text or on images, is that part of the knowledge graph or not? Is that association between the Eiffel Tower picture and Eiffel Tower, the entity? It's only a question of nomenclature. Like we keep internally our definition of knowledge graph ends up being more, more the schematic and structured information and we keep some of the associations with unstructured information in a different layer. It's, it's just a matter of nomenclature. We could call the whole thing a knowledge graph, which blends together unstructured and structured information. So in that sense, even today, we, we go much beyond uh, factoid or very structured factual information. Okay, thank you. So Caleb, there's a whole bunch of questions for you, but I will club them all together and they're all around Okay, how have you architected your system? Are there like myriad of tiny services? What does your infrastructure look like, tools, et cetera? So in general, if you can give uh, information about your implementation and also you can feel free to point to any document that the students can take a look at yeah, later, so also, even that is good. Yeah, so um, on the blog, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff. So for video, if you look in the blog for ML Summit, so the, the Google's uh, Google Cloud's ML Summit, um, I actually talk a lot about um, the core infrastructure and also, um, what was it, um, between the brackets, on GDEs, G between the brackets. Again, on the blog, you'll see those. And so the short answer is um, we have many different architectures depending on, you know, the content. So for radio and television, um, you know, those are collaboration with the Internet Archive. Um, so, for example, for those, it's very simple. We essentially just have a, in fact, there, it's, it's literally just a simple set of scripts. Um, they take the video files, stream them in, stream them through the, the Cloud AI APIs, stream out the annotations, reformat the annotations slightly, 
Um, and for example, we generate like we have the raw file, we generate a summary file, we generate a couple summary so, files. So, and then so, we write those. so Caleb, I think people are wanting some answer at the level of, are you using RDF? Are you using uh, Neo4j? Are you using triple store? Are you using the relational database? Like at the software yeah. level. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so at the software level, um, everything essentially is depending on the data set. Um, so we don't, you know, most people, they try to come up with sort of a master data, again, being in the scientific computing world for so many years, we tend to try to come up with one master, you know, data format that does everything. Um, for us, we don't because um, in particular, because our data sets are so wildly different. So one is attempting to extract out schema.org. Um, you know, one is looking at geographic data, one's looking at this. Um, so internally, um, we tend to represent data at the richest form that we use it at. Uh, so, for example, for schema.org, it's literally we extract out a schema.org block and we encode it in JSON for you. We basically put it as a JSON blob inside a JSON file, and that's it. And so at compute time, then, is when we actually parse that out and then perform analyses on it. Um, same thing for, say, imagery. So for imagery, we take an image, we extract out, you know, we run it through Cloud Vision, we have, you know, it outputs an enormous JSON, we add a bunch on top of that. That's how we store it as, as enormous. So essentially, we store these things as, these, as raw files, because then let's say that we're interested in a co-occurrence graph of labels, that's very easy to extract that out, versus what we found is originally we tried coming up with some master file formats. The, the global knowledge graph actually was that massive behemoth file, you know, graph to represent everything. Uh, but then what we found is that didn't work as we start adding in different modalities and different things. Um, that all that broke down, and so we internally, we essentially construct the graphs at, re, at runtime as we need them, and that's doable today because things like BigQuery and these other tools, um, you know, they brute force their way through it, so there's no additional really impact of that per se. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so the short answer yeah, is we construct that's... the graphs in real time. Okay. Um, and part of that I'll add is because the graphs that we're most interested in oftentimes are these enormous graphs. Like we want to know anxiety, you know, co-occurrences of this within this, within this, within this, within this, within this. It's impossible to represent all that as a graph, at, as a as a manifested graph, the storage would be. So what's interesting there is because for us really compute today, storage is still your bottleneck. Um, computers no longer really bottleneck between GPUs and TPUs and memory and all that. Um, the construction of the graph is not the bottleneck, it's getting it off. So for us, by storing it in its most compact form, constructing those graphs in real time, um, that sidesteps, that allows us to deal with these, these truly breathtakingly large graphs. Okay. Thank you. So this is a very specific question for Shashi. Uh, those links that you, suggest, uh, that you showed, the slash x slash yxx, blah, blah, blah are the three based ones does google kg still use this organization for ids yeah we the the slash m slash space was invented by freebase the m m stands for meta web that's how we sort of uh, the m nomenclature came about we do uh, we do build off that like a lot of our legacy for the knowledge graph comes from the meta web slash freebase acquisition that google did but we have extended that in numerous other ways. Like in, you, you might have spotted a slash G slash ID in one of my slides. And that, those are like for other internal uh, data types and entities. So it's extended beyond the slash M. You can roughly think of the slash M space as corresponding to what's available on the free and open web, like such as Wikipedia entities, but there's like a large superset of that that uh, uh, exists in the knowledge graph. Okay, thank you. Vinay, Mike, do you have any questions? There are tons of questions here, but why don't you go ahead with some of the questions you have in your mind? Well, uh, there was this question, which I think is applicable to both of the panelists. Uh, I think a question was posed to Shashi that, can you tell us more about how complex is the curation process, how many people are involved? But I think the same question can be asked of Caleb that, how do you know that all this huge processing you're doing is actually any good, right? I mean, is it really producing useful stuff or is it producing garbage or, I mean, how, how do we know? So Shashi, you want to go first? Yeah, I can go first, yeah. So uh, I won't spell out the exact number of uh, uh, stuff we have on this, but let's just say it's in the order of thousands. Uh, so it's a fairly large number of uh, curators. And again, if you remember from the slide I shared, 
curation is not just about people writing down factoids. It's about culling the schema. It's about mapping schemas across disparate sources and so on and so forth. Any number of uh, different activities or training machine learning models, all of that is curation. Uh, and that's what this staff does. Uh, we have a fairly sophisticated machinery around tools and the prioritization processes which feed into the, into the curation pipeline. So for example, we would have tools which would understand queries coming in and detect a potential change in the world. Like in this country, maybe a new president just got elected potentially. And to stay ahead of that, then uh, a curation task might be created to say, okay, go figure out if uh, a new president was elected in this country. Right, so to keep keep the knowledge graph fresh. So that's an example of sophisticated machinery. That's right. Uh, the other thing is we want to make sure none of our curators are just going and scraping proprietary knowledge from somebody's website. So so we have to make sure that they have attributed sources uh, which are accessible. They are we are allowed to have those sources. And secondly, those are corroborated sources. So if so you're looking across multiple sources. It's not just like you're picking somebody's proprietary information. So those are examples of things that we do in the machinery leading up to the curators, uh, which make sure we have integrity in our process. And finally, we get fresh and accurate data. Okay. Caleb? Yeah, and then, you know, from us, I mean, again, what are, that's one of the interesting things about GDELT is, you know, we're both trying to catalog the reality, but oftentimes more, inter more important than reality. So that's actually one of the interesting things here is, you know, with, with Google, it's attempting to catalog reality. You know, it, it tries to get as close to truth as possible. For us, our greatest interest is both cataloging reality, but then also cataloging the, the many parallel realities um, that people live in across the world. So, for example, uh, you know, take any, any issue that occurs that's maybe controversial, for example. How is this being framed across the world? So for, for us, you know, we include a lot of news outlets that um, you know, maybe our partisan outlets, or maybe not everyone would argue it's a news outlet. Um, and our goal for that is so that you can. So again, if you are, you know, so, so I think that the short answer is our grasp, we try to encode both reality and then all the different forms or, or sort of manif sort of quote unquote versions of, of, of truth no, that people. No, 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 I think the spirit of the question was slightly different. In case of Google, there is the validation by the search users. I mean, there are people searching and if Google doesn't give them good results, you'll get angry customers. So what is the validation of the graphs that you are building? How do you know that the graphs? That so that's actually, so that's a great point as well. So the technical accuracy. So one of the things that GDO looks at is it tries to create, a, so for many of our data sets where, you know, there is no, it's not a solved problem yet. Um, so even entity extraction from text is far from, you know, it's not a solved, no, there's nothing that works flawlessly. So what we do is we offer many different versions of that. So for example, for entities, um, for English language, we offer a simple thing it does. It's a, you know, a traditional HMM, uh, you know, uh, just basically all noun phrases. We also then annotate a whole bunch through Google's Cloud Natural Language API. Um, so you can see, you know, here's how it's functioning on these. Um, for sentiment, uh, we have about 4,000 of those um, emote dimensions. Many of those overlap, so you can compare. For example, and this is a good point, actually, certain algorithms or certain toolkits are built on certain domains. So maybe something's adapted more to, say, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe general news versus maybe political news. And so we oftentimes will apply each of these. Um, so essentially, the short answer is we'll give you many different tools, and then you can experiment and decide which of these is the most accurate in your domain on your needs, or maybe you've built something to work around the idiosyncrasies of a certain tool. So that's essentially the way we look at it is, you know, again, there's very few areas here that are solved problems. And so for us, essentially what we do is we give you many different lenses so that you can, you know, actually support scholarship in that area. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Mike, did you have any questions for the panel? Uh, no, I'm okay. I just want to listen in. I don't, but it's, I think there are a lot of other questions on the chat, so we try to cover some of those. Sounds good. So, uh, Shashi, there are a whole bunch of questions. I'll try to club them all together. Uh, there are questions about, uh, okay, what's next in knowledge graphs? Any uh, advice for startups who are entrepreneurs who are thinking about ideas? on what to invent, um, what to start, et cetera. Any, anything about that topic? Uh, I'll mention uh, a fairly technical topic and definitely a, like wide open space problem. 
so so take take the example of language understanding that i gave in my talk which is okay you're trying to build a machine learning model to recognize to translate surface forms across different languages into a meaning uh, a structured representation of meaning form like a sql or some such form uh, at the same time you have like this incredible explosion in uh, distributed models and in neural nets like we recently last week for folks who followed google io we talked about uh, this technology called mums uh, essentially multimodal multimodal uh, networks uh, in incredibly large uh, parameter uh, models like uh, hundreds of billions of parameter models uh, i think so far the research in these areas has been somewhat split the people building large uh, models for language have been mostly working in the word space uh, and of course because of large training inputs like essentially the entire web for training you you learn quite a bit and then there's a structured knowledge part which i simply think of as humans having figured out how to canonicalize certain things right like whether you say president biden or joe biden or potus or current president it means the same thing at the current time and so the canonicalization of that is an entity so uh, i don't think anybody has quite figured out how to marry these two techniques together while you can imagine like starting from really really simple things like take the take the tokens which are in the string or language space and canonicalize those into additional tokens imagine you added a slash m slash joe biden to the vocabulary and now you canonicalize to that and you use that in your training model but what can you do further like connections how can you learn from the connections that are in the structured representation to learn your language model i think there's a wide wide open space there about how to combine the two uh, to me that's the very exciting okay cool <laughs> So, so Caleb, I was wondering that amongst a variety of use cases that you uh, shared with us, which one, in your opinion, you are most proud of, or which one you think has had the most uh, real-world impact, and what it was? Yeah, you know, it's incredible. I mean, GDAL is is power so much today. Uh, you know, from bio, you know, bio surveillance, so looking at disease outbreaks to um you know food instability around the world to you know i mean it's incredible all the application all the areas i mean to me what one of the most inspiring stories is that in 2014 we discovered we had actually seen the early glimmers glimmers of ebola uh but at the time we didn't have the machine translation capacity to do that um and so that's what led us then to say you know it's worth and, and you know when we talked to folks most of the folks we talked to said it's not worth translating the world um you know just look at english it's important it'll show up in english and this came this was so much from the academic world and you know we said look this is this is you know i think there's real value here so this led to this huge i mean enormous infrastructure translated at this scale because again we're translating absolutely everything so fast forward to december of 2019 and you know the fact that you know what was that uh 6 years later or 5 years later uh that you know that actually that actually worked that you know this bio surveillance firm blue dot up in Canada they built basically they built a machine learning model that takes our open data feeds and every 15 minutes processes it and that it flagged those early glimmers of it was at the time it was called a uh, SARS like viral pneumonia of unknown origin it flagged that their people you know their human reviewers uh confirmed it they called up got some additional details they sent out a worldwide alert in December 31st 2019 like to me that just like that shows the power of this that um you know to to say look um and that also shows again the power of translation the power of looking across the world of these unexpected things and to me that that just summarizes it to say like you know this was the early one of the earliest alerts and this actually was one of the very first external alerts and it came within hours of the governmental alerts um of the internal alerts like to say that you know this worked and i think that that's the that's just so powerful of a story okay yeah that's that's a great story kelo so we are uh, nearing the end of our class times and maybe uh, you know each of you could take 30 seconds each to tell us um, uh, what's next for you or what what should be next for knowledge graphs in general yeah uh, shashi you want to go first yeah so for me personally i uh, i've moved on from general search to verticalized search even more so so i'm currently focused on e-commerce and uh, building out essentially i talked about the 24 billion uh, shopping related entities building out applications and building a com compelling e-commerce application in google uh, really excited about that 
uh, where uh, uh, in terms of where knowledge graphs could head again like similar to my previous answer i feel like uh, structured knowledge and the unstructured knowledge of the form you find on the web i think i think i think there is a real opportunity out here to bring those together on a similar similar platform out here somebody has to figure out the right abstraction i don't think we have quite figured it out uh, semantic web and such is basically unstructured documents with semantic overlays is there something deeper than that uh, i don't think we have the answers but i think i think we have the tools now to start answering those questions okay good that's a great answer kela yeah, I mean, I think for us, you know, the real, again, the holy grail is something that can read the news as we're monitoring around the world and that can catalog the factual claims that are within there. Um, again, there's so many approaches out there today. You know, no one's actually solved that problem. Like, again, there's, there's so many different tools, you know, whether they're grammar or neuro or embeddings and all these different ways that people are trying it. But there's nothing today that can robustly read a news article, publish even just within English, um, and codify that in a robust way that allows us to, you know, not just do simple Q and A. I mean, again, Q and A. I mean, again, today Q and A is finding similar sentences. It still relies on a human. We want to get to the point where it's codified in such a way that the machine can reason over it, and you know, identify, you know, identify contested narratives, identify conflicts where you know a fact checker has already, you know, determined this. So here's some news coverage that's going against it. Is this incorrect information or is this new information that you know maybe needs to adjust this? Like that to us is the holy grail. And you know, again, one of our goals is to just produce more and more data sets to try and enable research in that space, to create some of these fundamental open data sets. And again, GDL is part of the Google Cloud Open Data Sets program. Um, so all this data is available, and you know, we're just just excited to see like what can we enable like what what new things about knowledge graphs that i can't even imagine um that people are able to do with this data all right yeah thank you all uh, so yeah we are at the end of the class time with that i like to both of you for uh giving us your time i think both of you have clearly had enormous impact you're working at, on very exciting problems at the heart of knowledge graphs so we learned a lot from you uh, as far as the class is concerned, we'll continue our discussion on Thursday. Our focus on Thursday is going to be on uh, uh, high value uses of knowledge graphs in the financial industry. So thank you all very much and we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you so much for having us.